a very good afternoon and thank you very much for making time to uh, talk to us here. Uh, let me start with you, Emmanuel. And I'm going to ask all of you to give your opening statements to the simple question about what you think the solution is to the country's power crisis right now. What do you believe is the solution to the energy crisis facing the country? Good afternoon and thank you for having me on the show. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity um, just to discuss what you call a very easy question, which uh, but I think is a very difficult question, almost an impossible question for one person to answer. And that's why I think, you know, more discussions like this panel should take place, you know, in order for us to come up with the right solutions. You know, it's, it's my view that at the moment that the private sector and the government need to come together in finding these solutions in, for, for the energy crisis. We're finding ourselves in a position where, you know, it's the energy sector is monopolized and uh, monopolies don't breed for efficiencies, don't allow for, you know, certain things to happen as quickly as it would in the private sector. So I believe it's a taking of hands of, you know, private sector and government, it's a taking of hands of renewable energy and, you know, fossil fuel energy, you know, fossil fuel energy has become cleaner and there are technologies that are allowing for cleaner fossil fuel energy. So we believe that it's a, it's a combination of a coming together of different spheres, different organizations, different governments, and, you know, coming with a plan that we can all action and, you know, be proud of. All right. Uh, Liz McDade, talk to us. What do you think? are the solutions. Good afternoon. I think we need to focus on affordable, diversity, good governance, and making sure that we don't store up environmental problems for the future in any short-term solutions we put forward. So I'm very sure that cleaning up the mess uh, includes making sure that those people responsible are accountable. I think it's also about relieving ESCOM. Uh, at the moment, it's, it's flailing around. So the president's announcement was really welcome, but it's probably only the first step. Mm. Uh, I think we need to focus on energy efficiency. Calculations show we could save about 25% of our energy. Shifting the load means that we don't have these, these high peaks. We can flatten the peak. So everybody working together, I think, there's many solutions which can be put on the table short term to alleviate the, the crisis. And then over the next couple of years, as all these small projects come on, that's going to help us going forward. All right. Chanda Mumalo, what's your take? Thanks. Um, I think I'd reiterate what the previous two speakers have said, really. Um, it, we've welcomed the announcement by the presidency. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in industry to get to this point and um, lobbying with, with government. But I think now that we have the announcement and the policy, we need to get the regulations bedded down so that projects can be built and implemented. And I think that's where sometimes the um, there's a bit of a gap in timing. We're, we're in a situation where, as you said at the beginning, load shedding is causing issues for not just households, but businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to relieve that situation, we really need to build projects to connect them either to the grid or to allow households to be able to be in control of their own electricity. Um, and again, to reiterate what Liz has said, it's not just about producing more power so that we consume more power. We also need to understand uh, that we need to be more efficient with the use of, of what we have. Very interesting take indeed. Let me uh, close with you, Dr. Calvin Kemp. Talk to us about what you think the proposed solutions are here. Well, I think there's not one solution. Electricity is the lifeblood of the nation. Electricity throbs through the country and means the entire industrial infrastructure of the country operates. Every hour that there's not electricity flowing in the country, not only is Eskom losing income, but there are industries all over the country losing income. It's hugely economically damaging to the nation. We've got to understand the entire country needs this. Then we have to look and say to ourselves, we have to divide this into the six month problem and the six year problem. At the moment, everybody's focused on the six month problem saying, oh dear, I don't want load shedding tomorrow because I'm having a dinner party or something like that. What's important is the people that are going to build extensions to motor car plants, 
people who are planning to build new factories mm. to provide work opportunities for the future. They are looking half a dozen years into the future. No big car company is going to come here and build a huge extension to their manufacturing plant on the off chance that there might not be electricity to power it in half a dozen years' time. So we've got to look at this thing as a solution to working towards the economy flowing daily in the interests of everybody so that the costs of not only electricity are at their lowest, but bread and butter and machinery and cars and everything we buy. So it is something that really needs serious attention and it's complex. All right, Dr. Kemp, thank you for uh, those opening statements. Well, uh, you have heard the panelists. When we return, we're going to drill deeper. Just how big is the electricity problem in the country and how long will it take to actually fix it? Very good afternoon to you and you are watching the uncensored debate and with my panelists we are discussing the issue of uh, the electricity shortage in the country. Let me come to you, um, Emmanuel Ngulube. You are the CEO at uh, ENT Minerals and um, uh, just out of interest, you are trying to win over uh, the optimum coal mine. You are bidding for that particular mine, but not that it's of uh, much relevance to the topic at hand. Just how big is the problem of electricity when it comes to the mining space? And how badly do you think that sector is affected? Oh, it's, um, it's, it's almost grievous at the moment. I mean, we, we look at the um, optimum has been in business rescue close to four years. And um, it's, 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 it, used to burn about, it used to supply about 6% of Eskom's electricity, which is pretty much about 2,000 megawatts, which, is, which hasn't been supplied over the last four years due to the current rescue process. It is also just we found that the inefficiencies of Eskom's purchase contracts, you know, the, the corruption that is taking place within the organizations themselves, you know, it hemorrhages not just um, Eskom and the power generation, but it also hemorrhages, you know, the everyday person, you know, um, with the load shedding that we're experiencing at the moment, um, with just supplying food for your kids at home. You know, there's workers that have not had jobs for the longest time, and all these things, you know, have a downward trickle-down um, sort of impact. You know, it even goes down to your, your child studying for the exams. You know, all these things and all these inefficiencies have such a massive impact on the, on the rest of the country, you know, right down to the grassroots level. And from the economy side, I mean, as you know, um, as I've said as well, Optimum was also another 6% provider into all um, global exports, which also, again, you know, it's, it's, it's left a massive gap. All right. Liz McDade. You are with um, Altam, and you were partly responsible for fighting off the trillion rand nuclear deal that was touted in the year 2017, if I remember correctly. You won that part. You are now involved in yet another battle. This one is around the car power ship, and... It's got to do with uh, the environmental impact that uh, you are arguing for. So, my question to you is, what should we as South Africans do? Because we want the emergency power, and that, and that is what this car power ship deal is meant to try and plug in this gap of... Um, emergency power that we so desperately need so that we don't uh, go on with this uh, load shedding problem? Yeah. So firstly, I think we need to acknowledge that this uh, so-called emergency risk mitigation uh, bid has been dogged with controversy. Uh, lots of irregular uh, issues coming up. And so, yes, we need, we need more power urgently. But the way this has been set up is we have ended up with very expensive possibilities coming in. And the car power ships, which have taken the lion's share of it, certainly seem to be uh, very problematic. And one of the problematic things, which is what we have to look at when we're looking at solutions, 
is that you can't bring in an energy solution that then destroys something else. Hmm. And so here you're looking at an energy solution that would destroy a whole lot of livelihoods and potentially permanently, because you're looking at 20 years. So there are a few other um, projects that made the grade, and uh, we are hoping that government starts looking at a slightly different way of meeting that gap. And I'm sure that other panelists can speak to that, but from my perspective, we have already a whole lot of renewable energy plants around, mm -hmm. and apparently some of them have got excess. So let's buy that excess. Then um, whatever's in the pipeline ready to roll, let's make the red tape go away. Let's make it a very smooth bureaucratic process, which is still good governance, mm -hmm. still transparent, but then becomes an efficient use uh, of, of time and energy that we have the regulator that just smooths through this process. Yeah. Um, so that we can get things on the grid and working. And that's what we need. And, and I think the critical thing is often um, these, these short gap measures suddenly seem to attract all the sharks and we end up with with the with the brown paper bag scenario if i want to say um <laughs> so so short term who created the crisis who's going to benefit from solving it these are the kind of questions we have to be asking we have to be awake as south africans mm. uh the one trillion deal was a good lesson let's not get into that kind of thing again um and 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 let's look at what we've got homegrown why do we need a turkish ship mm. homegrown uh you know uh, power plants things that can provide work to south africans build a manufacturing industry and push us towards the future and uh, not lock us into a fossil of a past okay all right uh, shanda i suspect that uh, the words from liz that uh, renewable energy uh, should come in to also try and plug this gap. That's music to your ears as people in the photovoltaic industry. Explain to us very briefly first what your industry specifically uh, deals with and linked to that question, how soon can power be generated from uh, renewable sources? Um, okay, so the, uh, the SAPVIA, or the South African Photovoltaic Industry Association, is an association of members that is focused on supporting our members to build the solar industry in South Africa. And that ranges from small-scale installers putting uh, panels on, on rooftops in homes, right up to utility-scale projects, so the 75 megawatt projects that and you will have seen that government uh, have procured in, in previous rounds. Um, and and everyone in between um, companies that are providing engineering services, construction, operations and maintenance, cleaning of panels. So we represent the whole range of, of um, the industry uh, players. Mm. And then your second question was how soon can um, projects come online? So I think maybe we'll take a step back and to respond to what Liz said. The emergency procurement round, um, the lion's share went to the car power ships, but um, several projects were awarded that were solar PV combined with battery storage. Mm. And why that's important and exciting is that renewables are forming are performing as dispatchable generation, which means ESCOM can call on them when they need them and put, plug them into the grid, um, which is very exciting and really uh, cutting edge globally um, in terms of the projects that South Africa is delivering. Mm. Then what also um, government brought online is uh, what we call round five in the industry, which is the Renewable Energy Procurement Program. And um, so there've been four previous rounds. Round five is currently ongoing and will, the bidding is due on 16th of August. Um, and that is for 2,600 megawatts of power, both um, PV and wind that needs to be online by the end of July, 2022. Um, so quite short time periods to build it. Mm. Plus, if you look at what we have been discussing in this um, context, which is this raising of the cap to the to 100 megawatts, there's also a whole lot of projects that are sitting waiting in the wings that can be um, built quickly um, in the next in the six to nine months, depending on the size of the project. That are able to supply and private um, companies, private households, in order to generate their own power. Um, as I think the previous two speakers have also said, 
what is needed um, is, is ensuring that that process runs more smoothly um, so that we can get the power onto the grid as quickly as possible. So in order to build it, industry is ready and waiting to participate, um, but we need the regulation to allow smooth and efficient implementation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Kemp, let's bring you into the conversation. You are an advocate of nuclear energy. The decision dating back to 2017 that was fought off by Liz and um, her activists, were you in support of that? Well, may I start off, please, by making a very important distinction between the measurement megawatts and the measurement megawatt hours. Okay. Megawatt hours is how much electricity you use in total. At the end of the month, a householder gets an invoice from the municipality. In the case of their house, it's kilowatts. And you pay for kilowatt hours. But if it's the megawatts or the kilowatts, that's how much available power you have now when you turn the lights on. And that is what industry wants. Industry wants power that's available now, all the time, dispatchable power. Dispatchable means you know it's there. When you pay for electricity, you don't just want to pay for the amount you use. Mm -hmm. You also want to pay for the reliability factor that is always there. Now, in the case of nuclear power, for example, right now, the nuclear power from Kubo Nuclear Power Station outside Cape Town mm. is the cheapest power in South Africa by far, mm. by far. And there's another 20 years plus to go where Kubo will continue to produce South Africa's cheapest electricity. We've got to look at keeping the machinery of the nation running. It's all well and good to worry about having your house lights on in the evening, but it's the mines that have to be kept going. It's the production factories. It's the big machinery. That's where people's income comes from. That's where salaries come from. That's where the railways are run and all that type of thing from the reliable big power that you know is available all of the time. And this is why earlier I referred to the six-week problem, the six-month problem, the six-year problem. There's a difference. We now need to look at the six-year problem and say, what are we going to do? If you look back to 2008, when we were going to start building a large nuclear power station then, 50% bigger than what Kuburg is now, we mm. should have done that. It was a mistake to stop. Had we done that, we would now have 3,500 megawatts of power running reliably 24 hours a day, no problem. It would be there. In fact, we could have built two by now. The plan was to build three power stations sequentially. Now, I must point out here, you earlier mentioned a figure of a trillion rand. There was never a trillion rand involved. That was invented by antagonists in the press. The professionals in the business worked it out at the time, and it came out at 650 billion rand to build three power stations sequentially. It was never one trillion rand once in one year. It was projected into the newspapers. Mm. It was 650 billion over a period of 10 to 15 years. We've already spent about 250 billion on wind and solar so far. So we've spent already since then as much money on the wind and solar that we have that we would have spent on an entire nuclear power plant had we built the power plant near Port Elizabeth. All right. And what Dr. We Kemp, have intermittent power. Let, let me ask you no to pause there for a wind. moment. Let me ask you to pause there for a moment, and I apologize for that because uh, I think that uh, you've got lots more to add, and I wonder uh, whether Liz is going to have a thing or two to say uh, to respond to you. We'll continue the conversation in just a moment. Very good afternoon to you. This is Politics Unscripted, and uh, you're watching the Uncensored debate. We're discussing uh, the issue of electricity shortage in the country. Just before we went on a break, uh, Dr. Kem explaining that uh, 650 billion rand, this was uh, the proposal to build at least three power stations, nuclear power stations, uh, sequentially. And it was not one trillion that was going to uh, be thrown in at once. Liz, it makes me wonder whether you and the activists against nuclear power stations were wrong. I don't think we were wrong at all. Since the Zondo Commission uh, has been running, and I'm sure that uh, you, you and your viewers have been uh, keeping a note on that, 
the former minister, uh, finance minister Nenny has shown, and, re and there were cabinet minutes which were released, which we hadn't seen, which were available at that time, which show that the presentation that was made to cabinet underestimated the costs by about a third by using incorrect um, exchange rates and uh, leaving out key costs that you need for projects like uh, finance and, and development costs. And so in our submission um, to the, uh, the proposed new build that's on the table with NERSA at the moment, mm -hmm. we took those minutes and recalculated the costs. Um, and I, just, I don't have it in front of me, but it was close to a trillion. So I think the, the other issue I'd like to take uh, and disagree with is, is the Kuberg issue. This is something that nuclear promoters constantly put forward, is that Kuberg is the cheapest electricity. Well, of course it is, because the, all the capital costs have been paid off. Also, well, there is nothing in the kitty for the decommissioning and the waste disposal because it turned out, as was revealed earlier this year, that that's just a book value. So basically, written on a piece of paper, it says that, yes, we've got so many billions for decommissioning, but in fact, we don't have them because ESCOM's bankrupt. So, sure. so, so if something was to go wrong, we would need to decommission, we wouldn't have it. But obviously, the other issue is that it's not state funding that is going in to, to these renewables and these new plants. It's, it's private industry. So the government is not having to cough up for um, plants. And when you look at Madupi and Kusile and look at the cost overrun, mm. and, and somebody sent me something recently, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, so a, one of the um, new companies, as a Sabania Stillwater line company, reckons that it's gonna cost 5 billion Rand to put 400 megawatts of renewable power uh, up for their for their for their use, and if you remember, before we even had the one trillion nuclear deal, or many many years ago, we had the pebble bed, which was a small nuclear reactor, which was going to be the solution to all our woes. And this was like the late 90s and early 2000s. This was eventually scrapped in 2010, mm. having used up 10 billion rand, and there's nothing to show for it. So I think for me. When we are looking to the future for the electors, we look to, we need to look at what have we got on the ground right now and how do we expand that? We need to look at small um, re, uh, small projects, small uh, energy producers so that we can we can build exponentially. You know this right. is a very changeable world. Look at what COVID did to us. Anybody right. who was in the airplane business would be out by now. So those you know being being able to adapt, quite fast, I think is what we need to look at in the power sector now. All right, and uh, those are very interesting words from you, Liz. Emmanuel, adapting fast, you are a potential uh, mining player. What's a, what's a plan from your end? I see lots of mining companies uh, jumping up for joy, putting proposals in order to build their own power supply. Um, I, look, I, I remember a few years back, I spoke at the Mining and Renewables Conference, and um, I posed the idea of, you know, the coming together of the renewable sector and the mining sector. We find ourselves, you know, where the, the mining sector uses, places such a heavy load on our, on our peak electricity and everything else that it would be pertinent that these large-scale power producers, oh no, power, power users, should I say, um, you know, go renewable and take that load off, you know, the, the, the base load off um, the, the grid in order to free up electricity and power for, for the general public. Mm. Over and above that, I think, you know, right now where we sit is that the quickest way and the more efficient way, well, this is my belief, Liz may disagree with me completely, um, but <laughs> I believe that um, we need to get our coal-fired power stations running more efficiently. We need to get, you know, getting cleaner energy out of our coal-fired power stations. I think the idea that, you know, to just mothball all the, the coal-fired power stations that are out there at the moment is, is an error. You all know, right. we need to take over those things, add in new technologies in order to take, you know, the, the industry forward and in order to create better supply of electricity in South Africa. 
All right, Shanda, you get to have the last word. Will we ever see the end of coal-fired power stations? And I say that with uh, Midubi and Gusile, which are fairly new, and they are still operated using coal. They are still operated using coal. Look, I think what we have to look at is there's increasing pressure globally. And I think in your previous segment, you were looking at what's happening at the G7, all of the discussions around climate change and the pressure for us to clean up and reduce emissions. That falls on coal mines as well as um, coal-fired power stations equally. What we need to have in place really is a plan to facilitate a just transition from the coal-fired power plants to a cleaner um, economy. And that needs to bring along all of the communities that are in the, these mining areas, for, uh, produce jobs, train people up, allow them to access that power as well as the people in the cities. So coal is not with us forever. Um, really, there's, I think there's too much pressure from banks, from finance, from um, insurance, from politics for it to be a, a, um, along with us forever. But what we need to recognize is that South Africa is an economy that's really dependent on it currently, um, particularly in terms of it providing jobs to people across um, across the country. And so we need to ensure that we work together, as Emmanuel said, as a renewables um, industry and as um, the dirtier side of, um, of energy to, to enable that transition. Thank you very much, Shanda, for uh, that. Uh, Dr. Kem, I'm told that uh, I do have a small window, so you could add a little bit here. Uh, Shanda speaks about uh, the just transition. By the way, it is touted as uh, perhaps one of the many uh, topics that the president is going to be talking about at uh, the G7. In fact, he may have spoken about already. Uh, your view around nuclear, do you think there's enough appetite in the country, particularly if we're looking at uh, the integrated resource plan? Absolutely. As far as nuclear goes, we need the big nuclear power stations and we need the small ones, the pebble bed modular reactor type, which South Africa continued developing in Pretoria and uh, privately, and a reactor called the HTMR 100. We spent that money very, very wisely, the 10 billion that was mentioned earlier. And now what's happened is many other countries around the world have copied us and are following in our footsteps. And we unfortunately were about 10 to 15 years ahead back then. Now we've slid back to about equal to the leaders, but we're still in the leading field. But undoubtedly, we've got to be realistic. We've got to look at what is good for our people. We need our people to progress so that we have an advancing lifestyle. For that, we need coal from the north, high technology coal from the north with the colas. We need nuclear from the south where the water is for the big nuclear, and then we need the small modular reactors to be around inside the country at mining installations and places like that. Currently, there's about 10 African countries that have indicated to the International Atomic Energy Agency that they want to go nuclear. They're all pursuing the South African type small modular reactors that we were world leaders in developing and still are. But we've got to be realistic. We need to run the country. We need to get the machinery going. This just transition, incidentally, is something we can throw out. It's not needed at all. As far as I'm concerned, it's a complete fallacy. What we have to do is put inexpensive power into the system so that our people get better jobs, better prospects for the future, more money in your pocket, and we advance our economy. And that's done by being realistic and being sensible and using the right power in the right place at the right time. All right. Well, uh, with those words, we've got to be realistic. That's where uh, we end this conversation about uh, where to when we look at uh, the energy crisis that our country faces. That's uh, where we end the uncensored debate.